Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, the sixth film of the series, released in 1995. Curse is often regarded as a low point of the series, and it's not hard to see why. Marred by a plague of production issues, including nearly a dozen rewrites, the theatrical cut of this film is an incoherent mess, jumping between scenes and storylines without any reason or rhythm, and giving a half-assed continuation of the ridiculous cult stuff introduced in Part 5. Now, now, there is an alternate version of this movie called The Producer's Cut that does a better job explaining the cult storyline and that features more than a half hour of alternate footage, including an entirely different ending. While this video will only look at the theatrical cut, I'm happy to announce a new Dead Meat series, The Cut Comparison, that will examine the major changes between different cuts of the films I cover. The first episode will feature this movie, and if you're watching this in the future, you can click up there to check it out. But even that alternate version can't rescue what is, by all means, a bad movie. Sure, writer Daniel Farrens did his best to tie together and reference all the previous Halloween films, and yes, this is the feature film debut of Paul Stephen Rudd, everyone's favorite hot stepbrother slash bite-sized superhero. But neither Rudd nor Donald Pleasance, who returned as Sam Loomis in his final film role ever, can make up for this bizarre mess that had way too many cooks in the kitchen all trying to rewrite the movie mid-shoot. Maybe the kills wound up alright though? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with some crazy goddamn flashes that preview the wave of bullshit ahead. We surf that wave right into the ride queue of Indiana Jones Adventure, while shots with a squished aspect ratio reintroduce Jamie Lloyd, now played by J.C. Brandy after the studio didn't want to pay Danielle Harris a decent rate. They did you wrong, Danielle, you the best. In an uncomfortably sweaty scene full of weird dissolves and slow motion, Jamie is encouraged to push, push through a natural childbirth. No delicious drugs for her. After her baby is born, he's given to to that man in black bastard against the protestations of his mother, and then taken to a ritualistic ceremony where he gets the curse symbol for Michael's wrist tattoo drawn on his little baby body in blood. And no, I don't personally think it's necessary to censor baby genitalia, but who the fuck knows what YouTube has a problem with these days. A regretful nurse named Mary rushes the baby back to Jamie and kicks off an escape sequence with some stupid sound effects. After telling Jamie to save her baby, the nurse trots down a hallway only to get accosted by Michael Myers from the shadows. He lifts her up by the neck and, thanks to this convenient wall spike nearby, is able to impale her through the head to give us the first kill of this film. You know, after watching all these movies, I think Michael just hates bare walls. He's always trying to decorate them with human bodies. At least he knows what he likes. Jamie escapes through a smoky dumpster in the ground and makes her get away from Michael as the classic Halloween theme gets picked on a guitar. She gets into a truck, and after the ponchoed owner yells at her, asking her what she's doing, he joins the kill count as well with a quick, gory neck snap for Michael out of nowhere. Pro tip if you ever find yourself in a Halloween movie, don't drive a truck, you will wind up dead. Jamie drives off and ends up at a bus station, where she heads into the bathroom with her baby who's still got that thorn mark on his chest. Maybe go ahead and wash that off now? The lights go out, and surprise, surprise, Michael and his silhouette have arrived. But when he checks out the bathroom stalls, he finds that Jamie's no longer there. She's driving that truck again, trying to escape her evil uncle, but he catches up in a van in no time and drives her off the road, causing her to crash into a bunch of pumpkins. She gets out of the truck and meanders her way into a barn, where in no time at all, Michael appears to choke slam her onto some farm equipment that, as we can see, goes straight through her torso. As she bleeds to death from her new stomach spears, Jamie reaches out her hands to her uncle, maybe for a hug or something? But all he offers her is certain death by pushing her deeper down onto the spikes. And if that wasn't bad enough, Michael motherfucking Myers then turns the machine on so the blades can multiply. Jamie Lloyd's insides. A gory end for the best character of the middle Halloween movies, but since it's not Danielle Harris, it's kind of hard to muster up an emotional reaction to it. Michael heads back to the truck to collect his, uh, grandnephew, I think is the right relation, but turns out that baby ain't there. It's just blankets! Time to meet this movie's new characters, who happen to live at the old Myers house. Apparently, now the man in black is speaking in dreams or some shit. Danny. Yeah, to this little kid Danny, who keeps seeing the MIB in his room. But when his mom, Kara, looks in the dark corner, all she sees is a colorful pachycephalosaurus toy. Where'd you get that, Dan Dan? Things dope. Kara puts Danny back to bed and goes to her room to get undressed for sleep times herself. But careful there, Kara, because across the street, you've got a peeping Paul Rudd spying on you with a camera. That is not being a very good role model, Paul. Rudd plays Tommy Doyle, the little boy Laurie Strode babysat in the original film, and he calls into a shock jock radio show, hosted by a dude named Barry Sims, to talk about his 
obsession with the shape and make a prediction that old Double M will be coming back to Haddonfield soon to kill once more. Listening to this program is Dr. Sam Loomis, who talks back to the radio when another caller says that he heard the good doctor died. Not dead. <laughs> Just very much retired. Loomis gets a visit from Dr. Terrence Wynn, the same character he briefly talked to in a single scene back in the original film. So, like, yeah, you totally remember that guy. He's super important and very memorable, right? Right? Wynn says he's retiring from Smith's Grove and wants Loomis to take over for him, because nobody makes a better replacement for your job than a 75-year-old recovering stroke victim. It's now Halloween day in Haddonfield, the perfect time for neighborhood kids to set up Michael Myers pranks in the front yard of his old home. The angry patriarch of the family living there now is Kara's dad John Strode, who would be Laurie Strode's uncle since he's the brother of her dad who we briefly saw in the original film. John's wife and Kara's mom is Deborah Strode, and yes, these parents were named after John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. But as we'll see, their relationship is one with domestic abuse involved, so like, maybe don't do that. Their other kid, Kara's younger brother Tim, is hanging out with his nephew Danny in matching shirts extolling the kick-assery of that radio host Barry Sims. Barry kicks ass! John comes in all pissed off about everything in the world, and during his angry old man rant, calls his grandson Danny a bastard. When Kara tries to defend her son, this happens. I see only one bastard in this house. <laughs> Damn, dude, you better watch that shit, because that kind of assholery will earn you a knife pointed at your belly, courtesy of your own grandbastard, Danny, whose character was actually named after an equally disturbed little boy, Danny Torrance. Danny's not the only one hearing voices all day, though, because Tommy Doyle's been poring over a recording of Barry's show from the night before, which Jamie Lloyd had actually called into shortly before her murder. Tommy hears a bus station PA announcement in the background of Jamie's call, and that leads him to the depot she made her call from. He follows a trail of somehow uncleaned blood into the bathroom, where he finds a somehow unfound baby in a cabinet. Looking for babies in bathrooms, man. 60% of the time, it works every time. Tommy takes the baby to a hospital and finds Dr. Loomis just, uh, standing there, so that's convenient. In this cut, there's really no reason for him to be there. Sure, he and Wynn have already visited that barn and found Michael's calling card burned into some haystacks, but Jamie Lloyd is dead. There's no reason for him to be at the hospital, unless he was getting some routine checkups. Which, you know, at that age, isn't a bad idea. So, actually, good job, Loomy. Way to take care of yourself. Tommy tells Loomis that this stranger baby is Jamie's son, and that they should meet later at the local college campus if Loomis wants more tea on Michael. Then Tommy takes off, hunched over like a baby snatching troll. We go to that campus next. It's Haddonfield Junior College, of course, where Kara attends classes with her brother Tim and his girlfriend Beth. After Kara drops her books on the ground, Beth finds a creepy picture drawn by Danny, and because we're in the 90s now, Tim does a really bad butthead impersonation. <laughs> I think it's cool. <laughs> that sucked. Meanwhile, Michael has made his way home and is spying on Deborah Strode as she cleans up the Halloween decorations. Uh, hey lady, maybe you should actually leave those out for Halloween night. Wouldn't want Sam to get ya. Instead of Sam, though, Deborah's gotta worry about a creepy voice calling her on the phone. We want the child. And after it hangs up, she turns around, presumably sees Michael Myers, and then runs off in the stupidest chase scene I've ever witnessed. What, did you forget the layout of your own backyard? And now she's being bested by bed sheets? When she tears away another sheet, she finds Michael standing there with a hatchet, and he kills her with a mighty swing that covers those clean linens in her blood. Good luck getting those stains out, Mike. It's gonna take a whole lot of club soda. I guess he acted fast to get him out, though, because when Kara gets home later that day, she doesn't find any blood sheets hanging up. In fact, all she finds is her son Danny playing Game Boy Classic on the bed, while Tommy Doyle cradles a stranger baby. <laughs> Nothing weird about that. Besides, Tommy and Danny seem to have hit it off real well. But Tommy's my new friend, and he knows all about dinosaurs. Oh, this fool know about dinosaurs? That changes everything. Welcome to the family, motherfucker! Tommy takes them across the street to the boarding house he lives at, run by the elderly Mrs. Blankenship. No relationship to the Hellcat Ida Blankenship, though. She was an astronaut. Tommy hops on his high-tech personal computer, and after kicking up the 4D 3D 3D 3, he boots up Microsoft Myers, to explain to Kara that that thorn symbol is actually a constellation and a, uh, a rune? And, uh, I, I don't know. Just keep looking at the screen so I can sniff on that hair, girl. Mm. He says the cult of the thorn is after Jamie's baby, so it can be Michael's final sacrifice for whatever reasons, and then he heads out to meet up with Dr. Loomis. After he leaves, Mrs. Blankenship tells Kara that Danny hears the same voices in his head that little Mikey Myers heard the night he murdered his sister all those years ago. And speak of the stalker, looks like he's right outside that window right now. Tommy told Loomis to meet him at this big carnival-looking festival taking place at the Haddonfield Junior College campus. The purpose of this party is to protest Haddonfield's ban on Halloween, and the guest of honor is radio shock jock Barry Sims, who's finally appearing in the flesh. Barry is played by Leo Jeter, but the role was originally written for Howard Stern, if you couldn't tell by the dialogue. 
Does she get this riled up in the sack, Tim? I bet she wears crotchless panties and barks like a dog. Stern turned it down because his own film, Private Parts, was just about to start filming. And also, you know, probably because he just read the script and was like, yeah, no, I'm good. When Sims finds out that Tim Strode lives in the actual Myers house, he demands a company move to go finish the broadcast live from Murder Mansion. Hope that's gonna be okay with drunk-ass John Strode, who crashes his way home and complains to an empty house about his empty stomach. Thanks for the dinner. After the lights in the place go out, he heads downstairs with a flashlight and finds those bloody sheets that Michael at least had the decency to wash. But he's not done. He's also ready to clean up this domestic situation. So he stabs John in the gut with a knife, then lifts him up and carries him across the basement so he can further stab him into the house's circuit breaker. In one of the more drastic differences between the two cuts of the movie, John's theatrical kill is a thousand times gorier as electricity surges through him, causing him to froth at the mouth and eventually making his goddamn head explode. Holy shit, that was awesome. It's one of the few advantages this version has over the producer's cut. Barry Sims, who takes after many characters in this series by not wearing pants, is headed to the Myers house and gets into a van to drive there. Turns out it's the wrong van though, cause this one has a Michael Myers inside who kills the stern wannabe by stabbing him a couple of times below screen. Later on, Tommy is shocked to find a little girl dancing around in what she thinks is just your average warm red rain, when in actuality, it's blood dripping down from Barry's corpse, which Michael somehow strung up in a tree with a bunch of Halloween lights? How the fuck do you even do that without anyone noticing? It would probably take like a ladder, maybe a pulley system, whatever. At least the commotion brings Loomis around so he and Tommy can finally reunite. Tim and Beth head back to his house, and even though Barry Sims just said he'd be coming over there with a whole goddamn radio crew, they light a bunch of candles and get to fucking each other in Kara's bed. And by the way, great framing with that candle flame. You're almost doing my job for me, cam op. Tim leaves Beth to shower the sex off, and when he gets out, he's promptly killed by Michael Myers, who comes from behind with his knife to slit his throat, and also his armpit, I guess. Maybe he was just trying to do a lymph node biopsy. I've been there. Across the street, as Danny hears more voices inside his head, Kara notices some lights at her house. She calls over and gets Beth on the line, just in time to do nothing, as Michael comes from behind and kills Tim's girlfriend by stabbing her a bunch of times in the back. Most of it in slow motion shots as the classic Halloween theme plays. Kara watches it all through Tommy's spy cam setup, which, let's not forget, is super fucking creepy, you schmuck. Next thing you know, Danny's following the voices in his head to the old Myers house, so Kara runs over there and sees him heading upstairs. She arms herself with a fire poker and goes up to her room, where she finds the bodies of Beth and Tim in her bed. Aw, where's she supposed to sleep now? Then she finds Danny, but not by himself. For a limited time only, this kid comes with a free Michael Myers. Kara actually manages to trick Mikey and knock him down the staircase with her fire poker, which puts him out long enough for her and Danny to escape the house and run outside. Tommy and Loomis have gotten back by now and find the baby missing from Tommy's room. Wait, yeah, did Kara just leave that newborn there when she ran across the street? What the fuck, Kara? In another scene, reminiscent of the original, Kara and Danny run across the street as Michael slowly pursues them and pound on the door they're locked out of for a while before they're finally let in to be safe from the stalker. Only turns out inside the house isn't that safe after all. Danny. Come to me. Ho ho ho, that is in fact the modulated voice of the man in black. He summons Dan Dan to his lap lap, then reveals himself to be none other than Dr. Wynn, the dude you've seen for like a minute so far in this cut. What a totally unexpected yet satisfying twist to this movie. Then there's just a cavalcade of craziness. Some Spanish Inquisition looking dudes show up, nobody expects them. Kara runs upstairs and finds Mrs. Blankenship is in on the cult, and then Kara fucking jumps out a window to get away from the cult. What? Dude, what are we even doing in this movie? Oh, calling back to that shot of Michael in the original? Cool, I guess. That shot fades to black and comes back to this. Where is she? Where's Kara? I don't know, man. This movie doesn't make any sense. I feel like I've been drugged. We have been drugged. What? When did that happen? I'll tell you something, I feel like I've been drugged just watching this incoherent mess. Kara wakes up in a cell at Smith's Grove, so Ant-Man and Dr. Loomis rush over there. Loomis leaves to confront his old colleague Dr. Wynn, with a handgun of course, and asks him for answers to questions like what the hell is going on in this movie. All Wynn has to say is that Michael is pure uncorrupted evil, and that the druidic thorn cult is going to use Jamie's baby for- Oh, the henchman knocked Loomis out. Could I get one of those too? You can wake me up after the movie's over. Meanwhile, Tom Tommy has heard some screaming and follows it deeper into the sanitarium, where he comes across a lady with bad teeth and a bloody stomach. She tells him that he's back now and asks Tommy how it feels to be damned before she falls to the ground dead. Who was she and what point did she have in this movie? I'm confident not a single living person could tell us. Tommy finally locates Kara, who's in room 237 for a really sweet reference, and as he bashes away at the doorknob with a fire extinguisher, Michael shows up and causes Tommy to twitch out in a real insane way. Seriously, Paul, I love 
love you, man, but I don't know what you're doing with your face right now. He eventually gets the door open and rescues Kara just in time to escape Michael's clutches. The two of them come across a cult meeting and clandestinely watch as the Thorn crew gets ready to, uh, honestly, I don't even know, but it definitely involves that baby. Apparently, the cult didn't clear their plans with Michael, though, because he shows up right outside the operating room and takes his pick from a selection of weapons available to him. I see you're going with the surgical machete. Good choice, Michael. Huge flashing lights warning to everyone watching, okay? Like, seriously, if you're an epileptic or anything like that, skip over the next minute. Because as Tommy looks through a window, he sees Michael go on a killing rampage while an extremely irritating strobe light goes off. During this massacre, he kills what I believe to be six doctors, two of them women and four of them men, including Dr. Wynn, who we never actually see die, but he's in the room and I don't think he's making it out of there alive. To be honest, though, it's real hard to tell because of all these flashing fucking lights. They're making me nauseous, man. Kara and Tommy escape with Danny and the baby and are running through a Freddy Krueger layer while Michael Myers chases after them. Also caught up in this chase is an injured doctor played by George P. Wilbur, who played Michael Myers in part four and the rest of this movie until he was replaced during reshoots by a slimmer actor, Michael Lerner. Tommy ends up locking a gate behind him and that spells the end for Wilbur's cameo, since Michael comes up behind him and kills him by slamming his head against the bars and pushing with such force that he breaks both the doctor's head and the gate itself. The protags run through the hospital as Michael speed walks after them until they get to a weird laboratory that wouldn't look out of place in a Power Rangers movie. What are those embryo babies? What the fuck? Tommy steps out of hiding and tells Michael he's won the game. Congrats! Here's your complimentary baby! But as Michael goes to collect his prize, Tommy injects him in the shoulder with a bunch of, uh, I, I don't know, stuff that really slows Michael down, but not too much to toss Tommy against the wall. Kara comes out and hits Mikey in the face with a pipe, then proceeds to do that over and over for a good while until Tommy takes over with another injection and an even longer beat down with the pipe. Kara, Danny, and the baby escape as Tommy just goes ham on Michael Myers. Damn, dude, you want to talk about it? He gets Michael real gross and green. Wait, why is he green? Before tossing down the pipe and walking away with a real unbecoming maniacal giggle. We get a very abrupt ending where Tommy asks a still living Loomis to come away with him and Kara. Loomis declines, citing some business he needs to tend to, and after they drive away, we see a shot of Michael's mask empty on the ground. The movie ends with the sound of Sam Loomis screaming from somewhere in Smith's Grove. And with that, I will put the good doctor on the kill count. Because sadly, Donald Pleasance passed away before this movie even came out, and this was their way to write the character out of the series. He has a different fate in the producer's cut, and yet another in H2O. But for this timeline, I'll count this as his death. With the good doctor included, how many kills did the theatrical cut of Curse give us overall? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Seventeen people died in the theatrical cut of Curse of Michael Myers, I, I think. Who knows with that strobe light? The victims included ten men and seven women, giving us this pie chart to look at, and with a runtime of 88 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 5.18 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to John Strode, obviously. Dude's fucking head blew up. Top that shit. Oh wait, you can't! Dull machete for lamest kill will go to the six doctors Michael kills in that insane scene. It's impossible to see anything clearly, and it doesn't even make any sense. Why is killing them all of a sudden? And why not give Wynn a proper death? Ugh. And that's it. Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers came out in 1995, one of the last pre-scream horror movies. The next Halloween film would be highly influenced by Wes Craven's masterpiece, and in the process, completely ignored this movie and the two that came before it. I'm talking about Halloween H2O, of course, which I'll cover next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Allison Whitehead, Pat Carr, Rachel Jackson, and Javi Rojo. Some of you are upset that I don't like these movies. That's okay, man. Everyone has opinions. Next week is a movie I actually do like, so look forward to that. Remember, if you're watching this video not on the day it came out, then the cut comparison should be out. Go watch it. I hope it's good. All right, thanks, y'all. Be good people.